I also graduated about nearly, uh, just over 10 years ago. And the most I got about fish health at uni was two lectures given by a dairy vet. The most <laughs> were about 20 years old. Um, so I guess, yeah, so I guess being a vet in this field, you're sort of pioneering um, in the world. Uh, and, but since then, there have been a lot more vets in the field, and I hope more vets will get on board as well. Uh, so in terms of the objectives, what we're going to talk about today, um, these are really important objectives because they'll probably be in your exam. So just make sure you learn at least these three things. Uh, so we need to be aware that animal welfare, or, or be aware of animal welfare as it applies to fish. Understand the three definitions of welfare and the methods of assessing welfare in fish, which we'll go through a bit later on. Uh, so we'll structure the talk, uh, I'll give you a bit of introduction um, to where, why we're talking about welfare, um, the different categories that we deal with fish um, in terms of welfare, what the costs and benefits are uh, with the human and fish interaction, uh, the definitions for the welfare, methods for assessing um, the well-being, the fish welfare criteria, and where we're at. Uh, but before we start, I'll just quickly give you a brief um, background about uh, why I've been invited to talk. Um, I graduated in 2001, and my first job was as a veterinary fish pathologist for Tasmania, where I worked a lot with the Uni of Tasmania and also as a diagnostic pathologist for the aquaculture farms. Um, Tasmania is a really beautiful state, but you do get bored because there's only a population of 70,000 in one system. And when I was there, I was actually there for the historic moment of the first Hungry Jacks in Launceston. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I, in that case, I sort of went off uh, interstate to Victoria, which is just 40 minutes flight away, uh, able to hook up with a retail ornamental fish shop. And been doing that since 2004 and currently now as well. Once a month, I go across, look after their fish health uh, and welfare, uh, ensure that uh, there aren't, uh, we limit the number of deaths if we can, uh, give proper medication and diagnosis for diseased fish. Uh, and also service private fish clients uh, when I'm there through the shop. Uh, in WA, I moved back here in 2007 and I've been working with a lot of pet fish owners, uh, ranging from koi to goldfish. Uh, and I guess the major clients are the Aquarium of WA and also Murdoch University where I do uh, little bits of teaching here and there. So, to get back to the lecture, um, humans and fish have been interacting with each other for centuries, even thousands of years. Um, but why is, are we only just talking about fish welfare now and why aren't they in line with other vertebrate species like mice, dogs and cats? One of the questions uh, I got asked by my friend is, are fish animals? Well, they're not plant or mineral. <laughs> and the next thing I was thinking in my head, man, where did this guy go to school? And then I realised, ah, oh, he was my classmate at Mount Lily High. <laughs> so I don't know which teacher he was listening to or not paying attention at all. Um, so fish are animals, and so, uh, rightly so, they should be afforded welfare. But um, animal welfare is a really complex um, issue. It's got a lot of scientific, ethical, economic, cultural and political dimensions in it. And when we're talking about fish, it's even more complex if you're, if you're comparing that with uh, other sort of cute and furry animals. Um, in terms of welfare, um, it doesn't matter what type of fish you are, um, you tend to be afforded most welfare if you are sort of in, in the line of sight uh, with the human for a large majority of the time. Uh, so if you look at this um, sort of this picture here, um, you can see that the wild fish and the wild harvest tend to be afforded the least amount of welfare and not many people think much about them. Uh, whereas if you go down the line towards the education and research, uh, they're afforded welfare that's in line with any other vertebrate animal. Uh, so I guess in terms of... Uh, Yep, in terms of, yeah, we'll skip that. We'll keep going. Um, yeah, if you've got any questions, just raise your hand and I'll 
try my best to answer them. So what are the benefits of and costs of the fish-human interaction? Um, in terms of aquaculture and live holding facilities, it creates jobs. Uh, it is seen as a more efficient uh, way of protein production. Uh, and it's also, in some cases, it's a sustainable keeping of endangered species. So, for example, the Murray cod were <coughs> endangered, but now they're being aquacultured. So they've actually found out the biology and things like this. And um, because they're an aquaculture species, there's monetary value behind them. Um, and people have bred them, uh, their species will never go uh, into extinction. The other benefit with fish, I guess, or eating fish, is that it makes you smarter. Um, it decreases inflammation and it gives you shiny hair. <laughs> but the negative aspects, which Alan will probably talk about more, would be the potential environmental degradation of fish farms. Uh, the wild fish, uh, the food that we're feeding the fish to grow fish, are fish. So it's sort of converting one sort of fish to another, in effect. So it, it's possibly not quite sustainable unless if we go towards more of a plant based diet for the fish. Um, there's also apparent increased disease prevalence and I guess the reason um, why this is so is that um, one of the major factors is that people tend to check on the fish a lot more often than they would with wild fish so is there an actual increase in disease or is that just because we are looking? Um, and I guess in some aspects of um, Aquaculture, you've got crowding of fish, increased handling, transport and slaughter. So that's, I guess, pretty much negative for the fish, um, but sort of uh, positive for the humans. So I guess the, the main thing um, about welfare is why, the reason why we haven't sort of all agreed on the one uh, solution for fish welfare is because different people have different definitions for welfare um, and I guess if you look at them they're not always congruent with each other so the first uh, definition of welfare is a feelings based so this requires the fish to feel good experiences and be free from negative experiences such as pain or fear so this would be more like what PETA the people uh, for ethical treatment of animals this is their definition uh, that they adopt uh, for animal welfare, including fish welfare. So, but the other side of the thing is, uh, of the coin is that, is it a human affliction? Um, do we actually know what it feels like to be a fish? Um, one of the things that uh, examples was take, uh, shown in this paper is that the question is asked, do fish actually feel love? when it's a breeding season. You know, love is in the air, it's love in the water. Um, you might think it's funny, but if you think about salmon, if you watch those um, wildlife shows, you see them jumping up the waterfalls, bashing their heads on rocks. Um, maybe love makes them go crazy, I don't know. Yeah. Um, and also, in terms of eating one another, fish, uh, a lot of fish tend to be piscivorous, so they eat other fish. Um, do they feel sorrow after eating another fish? So I don't know, it's, that's a bit of an iffy um, definition, but um, it has its um, sort of good part points as well. Uh, the other definition for welfare is functions-based. Um, so it requires fish to be in good health, meaning that they grow well, they're free from disease, uh, they breed and they eat well. Um, and this, I guess, if, when you've learned about farm animals, uh, these tend to be the ones that you look at in terms of production, uh, it benefits the farmer and it benefits the fish, so uh, there are no qualms at all uh, with this sort of definition of welfare, but I guess it is limited, it doesn't take into account um, sort of the feelings of the fish in a way. Then the last one is nature-based, so the third definition of fish welfare would be nature-based, so it requires the fish to be able to lead a natural life and express the full range of behaviour as they do in the wild. Um, if you've been involved in the unusual and exotic pet special interest group of the ADA, uh, they have a big clause saying that uh, they are completely opposed to feeding um, the pet's live prey. Um, so I guess in terms of the nature-based definition, um, not uh, giving them the 
opportunity to hunt or prey on live uh, animals, uh, that would mean that it's not really good welfare for them. Um, so I guess, yeah, there's, I guess there are graves and all these uh, definitions, they are right in their own way, but they don't all quite gel together. So I guess a good example of nature base would be zoos, where they provide a lot of facilities and equipment for the uh, animals to uh, play with and just do their natural thing. Um, so, on to the next slide, is that do we actually need to know, uh, do, we, do fish actually need to have feedings to be afforded good welfare? Um, anthropomorphism is used to decide physiological needs. Is that, um, is that a good way of doing that? Um, the physiology of a fish is so different, so why would the psychology this is saying so a fish lives in water, we live in air, and we can't sort of reverse, we can't have fish living in air and us living in water. So, and I guess if you read the men from Mars and women are from Venus, um, men can't even understand women, let alone how can we then project our feelings to another fish. And when I compare my wife to like things that happen, uh, that's happened in a cow before, or seen that in the canine case, <laughs> say, oh man, don't call me a dog and don't call me a cow. <laughs> so I guess if you're talking to a fish and you're comparing to a human, the fish will go, don't compare me to a human. Um, so in terms of the anatomy, um, they don't have a neocortex. The neocortex tends to be where all your feelings are made in your brain. So does that mean that they don't have feelings? So the scientific evidence so far is saying that uh, fish, does, or there is not enough evidence to support the feelings-based definition of welfare. So next one is the question, do fish need to be able to experience pain to be afforded welfare? Uh, it's a long sentence, but basically they do have the anatomy. And why do they have that? Um, the pain pathways are really highly conserved and the reason for that is because it's protective. It protects them from being injured uh, and from getting into more harm. Do fish need to be smart to be afforded welfare? Fish are not stupid at all. They're actually quite brainy. That's not a real fish, by the way. <laughs> Someone asked me if that was and it's not. Um, you know, there's this common misconception that fish have a three-second memory. Um, that is very, very false. Um, they have memories more than months. Um, they've done a lot of research. Um, if we are using sort of the Siamese fine fish, for example. Um, they've put sort of two males to fight each other, and then a third male watching. And then they put the three males, uh, and then one was a victor and one was a loser. And then they put the three males together in a really large tank, and you could see that the third male spent more time um, avoiding the victor and closer to the loser because he probably thinks that he can be the sort of the next alpha male. Um, they've also done experiments where they're sort of trying to ranch um, cod. So instead of keeping them in aquaculture net pens, they actually uh, train the cod to a certain sound and they'll bring the boat around and then they'll uh, associate the sound with feeding time. So all these cod will actually come and feed. And they've done that for experiment for about a year. And then three years later, they came back to the same spot, uh, projected the same sound, and all the cod still came to the boat. So in terms of the cod, they've got more than a three-year memory. And I guess the most recent um, research based on that one is that they're trying to then use the sound to attract the fish. That way they can trap them and harvest them uh, without causing all the environmental damage that is associated with dredging, uh, oh no, not dredging, those nets that sort of come along the bottom. Um, so I guess in, in this sense, fish observe and avoid danger. And in terms of um, reward system, um, fish, like dogs and men, they are sort of 
controlled by their gut. So if there's food, they're going to react well. So they've shown that um, positive experiences can be reinforced with food and the fish will be able to uh, do certain things um, based on a food reward uh, similar to how you're trying to train a dog. So I think if you go to YouTube, you can go to World's Smartest Goldfish. Uh, you'll see that this goldfish can actually go through hoops, uh, swim into your hands, kick soccer balls, not really kick, but sort of nudge it, <laughs> uh, and shoot basketball hoops. So um, yeah, if you go to YouTube, have a look at that. Um, that's all real. Um, fish have physiologic, measurable physiological responses as well. So if you look at this fish and you stress them, uh, they're going to increase their heart rate and their respiratory rate will increase. If you measure their hormone levels, it will also change. You will have increased cortisol. So very similar stress response to other vertebrates, including ourselves. So in terms of stress and well-being, um, short-term stress is not a bad thing. Um, it's a normal and necessary survival tool in animals. Um, however, chronic stresses have the potential to um, to harm the overall well-being of the animal. So in terms of short-term stresses, um, uh, this paper says that it's, it's not such a big deal as long as they are generally kept well. Um, I know, I guess, um, my wife just gave birth about a month and a bit ago, and she had the epidural, um, but then the doctor was saying that uh, we don't have to like kill off all the pain uh, because giving birth the pain is a natural thing. So it's okay to feel some pain, but if you really don't want it, we'll just give you a little bit to get the edge off, but we want you to feel pain. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's what she gets, that's good. <laughs> um, in terms of fish, we've got a different um, thing as well. We've got five senses. Um, so we've got sense of touch, smell, taste, uh, sight, hearing, yeah, good. And fish have an extra sense, they've got the lateral line system. So if you look at a fish, probably preferably a bigger one, you can actually see little dots along the side, on each side of the body, and sort of along the head. And this is called the lateral line system, and they can actually hear or feel vibrations in the water. And this way they can sort of detect um, prey, and they can also detect predators. So in terms of trying to sort of anthropomorphize, the fish to a human, uh, what does this mean, this extra sense? We don't have it, we don't know what it feels like, and how does this impact on their welfare if we're trying to give, uh, afford them good welfare? So I guess in conclusion, um, fish should be afforded welfare because firstly, we do not need to know what it's like to be a fish to afford them welfare. Um, and as veterinarians and scientists, there is an ethical duty to ensure welfare of aquatic animals that's under our care. And welfare, good welfare would involve diverse elements and it needs to be value-based assumptions and these need to be made openly. So you need to say, are you using the nat nature-based uh, definition? Are you using the function space? Or are you using the feeling space? Uh, and then we can sort of debate uh, based on those uh, principles. Um, I've got this picture here. Um, we've got some barramundi. You can see their eyes are glowing through the murky waters. <coughs> Do you think this is good welfare for the fish? Yes? No? How many say yes? How many say no? Okay, there are about eight no's and everyone undecided. <laughs> okay. Um, well, the undecideds are probably uh, on the right track because um, they're looking at this and thinking, hmm, it must be a trick question. <laughs> Veramundi are actually uh, so ambush predators and they do like murky environments and they feel better if they're sort of in dark uh, conditions. So in terms of the water quality, uh, you would have to test uh, that there are no uh, build up of waste, but in terms of the murkiness, that's probably really good with the tannins or a bit of muddiness, that's probably good for them. Um, and they don't like to be in pristine, clean tanks. Um, I think a lot of people who keep fish, they'll go, I'm going to do a water change and they clean everything, scrub everything down, clean the filters, and then put the fish in, 
and then they die in about two, two to four weeks later. Uh, and the reason why they tend to die is because of a knee tank syndrome, which is where the biofilter is no longer able to uh, process the load of the waste, and the ammonia and the nitrite can build up, and it can poison the fish, and they'll die in that way. So, when we are talking about fish welfare, uh, there's a lecturer at Uni of Tasmania who always says, a fish is not a fish, it's not a fish. Um, so, I guess if you want to put that into sort of more easier terms, you can say a bird is not a bird, it's not a bird. So you've got your ostrich, it's not like the chicken, it's not like the albatross, and it's not like the penguin. And similar differences um, have, uh, are present in fish. There are maybe more than 5,000 fish species out there. So when you're trying to talk about fish welfare, it's just a really hard topic because you need to actually study every single species uh, on different aspects. So you can look at the temperature, you can look at the salinity, the diet, they're all going to be different. Um, but a way, sort of a scientific method of trying to sort of uh, find the way of uh, what is good welfare for each different species is to sort of give it a fish preference approach in, ter in terms of your experimental design. So you'd have like a gradient of temperature and you can see where the fish spends most time. But even if the fish spends most time in one, t uh, in one temperature, it doesn't mean that uh, they will always like to spend uh, the time at that temperature. So in terms of humans as well, I guess um, some pe prefer people prefer cooler temperatures, some prefer hot. Uh, I know that when I was living in Tasmania, I came back to Perth summer and I was sweating through everything and I felt great. <laughs> but now after living here for four years, thinking, hmm, it's another summer, it's really hot. Um, so other factors that you need to consider as well is the feasibility of um, introducing this uh, in terms of commercial practice, the economic implications, and the political reality. Can we actually um, institute this uh, change if we want to make a change? Um, so as veterinarians, I think we're looked at as sort of the, the gatekeepers for animal welfare and. Uh, we're hoping that more vets get into the aquatic field as well. So things, um, as we were talking about the function space definition of welfare, um, ways you can assess welfare is looking at the biological parameters. So looking at the condition score, same, same as how you look at the condition score of cattle or sheep. Uh, you can do that with fish. Um, you can look at the growth rate, the food consumption, uh, the reproductive uh, capacity, disease resistance and mortality rate. So in terms of trying to get people to adopt um, uh, welfare, good welfare for fish, um, this is a really good selling point because it benefits the farmer and it will benefit the fish. Um, other methods for assessing welfare, um, which is more in the experimental side, is to take blood from fish and do testing. Uh, you can look at the cortisol, lactate and glucose levels and these change. Um, one of the parameters, uh, serum parameters, that we test regularly um, in salmon in Tasmania when they go through the smaltification process. Uh, this is where the freshwater phase of the salmon, uh, then they're sort of transitioning to the seawater phase. They actually give the fish a bit of a salt water challenge. So they put them into full strength seawater uh, as fingerlings when they're, they think that they're going to be changing uh, in the transition phase. Um, and then they take the blood. And if their blood shows elevated um, sodium or chloride levels, it means that the fish is sort of losing water or absorbing too much salt. That means they're not ready to go out to sea. So the farmer would then hold the fish back uh, another week or two and maybe do another challenge trial. So in terms of fish welfare, um, it might not be so good for the individual fish that are in the trial, but for the greater benefit of the um, sort of the rest of the fish um, and for the fish farmer's productivity, um, it is uh, sort of a, a bit of a trade-off. Um, so, yeah, so it's useful to look at different things like that. Um, as I was saying before, a fish is not a fish, it's not a fish. Um, water quality parameters, there are a lot of water quality parameters uh, that we can measure and different um, fish would sort of thrive or uh, 
or tolerate different um, temperatures or oxygen content and pH as well. Uh, if you talk about dissolved oxygen, it's just dissolved TBO, the first one. Um, if the dissolved oxygen normally, say at 24 degrees, um, is about 8 parts per million um, of oxygen in water, if that were to drop down to say 3 or 4 parts per million, uh, things like rainbow trout or salmon, they would really, really struggle at, that, at those temperatures. They'll actually go off their feed and they might even get secondary bacterial infections. Whereas if with that same temperature, uh, with that same oxygen level, you have, and you have koi fish in there, they're actually still thriving. They'll be eating, they'll be growing, uh, and they'll be really, really active. So, yeah, so we really need to know, uh, we need to test, sort of, for each species, what is good welfare. There's not just one rule that fits all fish. Um, other methods of assessing welfare would be looking at their behavior. So you can actually spy on them with a spy camera. And you look at their position, their orientation, their density, swimming effort, respiratory rate, and whether there's presence of erratic behavior. So um, I guess in terms of fish, sometimes if you go to the aquarium of WA or if you go to um, Cicerellos, you might see the big cod or the <coughs> rats lying on its side. And then a lot of people will go, oh, you've got a dead fish in there, or a sick or dying fish. But that's actually normal for them. They do lie on their side. Um, and then that's just how they rest and sleep. Uh, whereas if you're talking about a grainless shark or something, if it's lying on the bottom, it's definitely sick. Um, and you can also look at the orientation. Um, we've got, uh, in the ornamental side, we've got a fish called an upside-down catfish. And being upside down, normally with all other fish, it's a bad sign, but with this fish, it's normal. Um, and it's cooling density as well. Um, I guess in terms of... Some people might think that if you're crowding fish, it's a bad thing because they're crowded. We don't like cramped conditions, so why wouldn't the fish? But there are some species that are schooling fish. They actually feel a lot more stress if they're kept in a tank on their own or if, with very few fish. Um, so a lot of your sort of silver looking fish <coughs> tend to be um, schooling fish. Um, and also I guess some aquarium stores, if you were to go to an aquarium store and you were to buy some tetras, which are just little fish, uh, they would always um, sort of advise you to buy them in groups of five or more. So other things you can also put, uh, so for the environment enrichment side, this would be more a nature-based definition of welfare. Um, so in order to sort of meet those um, welfare definitions, um, environmental enrichment is always a good thing to have. So uh, some fish like to dig in the substrate or sift through the substrate to get their food. Um, some actually like to move large rocks and do a whole lot of redecorating because they don't like your decorations. <laughs> um, there's also tank design, um, co-inhabitants, uh, whether one fish will get along with another or not. Um, so for example, it's not good welfare to keep uh, more than two fighting fish in a small aquarium because one is going to attack the other and they'll probably fight to death. Um, whereas guppies are good uh, as tank mates with each other. Um, yeah, so I think one of the newest in, sorry, inventions in the ornament side is uh, this is called a koi ball. Actually, if you can see, it, it's a little ball, sort of similar to a kong for a dog, where you actually put the fish food in there and it floats on the surface, and the fish actually have to nudge it to get the food out. Um, other things you can do is also put your food inside ice bricks and then just put it there and let it melt over time and it just keeps them occupied over the day. So fish welfare criteria, what are they? So I pull this out of the animal welfare uh, criteria and apply it to the fish. So in terms of the first one, freedom from thirst and hunger and malnutrition. So to meet <laughs> this criteria, fish should be kept in water of appropriate biotype and given food 
in sufficient quantity and of suitable composition. Um, so it needs to be food that you give them, not just anything. <laughs> fish criteria, fish welfare criteria number two is freedom from thermal and physical discomfort. So fish should be kept in water suitable to their preference range um, and not just something that you just pulled out of the air. So it needs to be so sort of researched. Um, quite a lot of species uh, have got quite a lot of this water quality data. Um, a good website to get all this information is fishbase.org and you can type in the common uh, names of fish or the scientific names and it'll tell you all about the water conditions and where they've come <coughs> from and, and all the other biological parameters. Uh, fish welfare criteria, number three, freedom from injury and disease. Uh, so in terms of this, uh, fish suffering from ill health uh, should be given prompt medical attention. Um, so it shouldn't be left there to sort of die slowly uh, or to suffer. Um, one of the sort of the newish things that we've instituted at Barone Aquarium in Melbourne is uh, fish anaesthetic uh, for euthanasia of fish. So instead of leaving them in tanks to die slowly or putting them into the freezer, uh, you can actually put the fish into the anaesthetic solution, which is changed every day. Uh, in that way, we're sort of trying to do our best to promote good animal welfare in the ornamental retail side of things. Freedom to display normal, most normal patterns of behavior. So, <coughs> how what this uh, how this relate translates to a fish situation is that it should be provided sufficient space and hides, depending on the species, and given suitable tank mates. Uh, there shouldn't be an enclosed environment like that because it's not good. Um, so in terms of freedom for fear and stress, um, fish homes should be positioned in a suitable part of the building or garden. Uh, they should be avoiding excessive noise and protected from predatory animals. And I'm not sure if you remember this Libra Fleur advertisement. Uh, might have been before your time, it's probably about 10 to 15 years ago. But if you can find it on YouTube, it's really good. Um, this lady brings her goldfish in a bag to the fish shop. Goldfish has googly eyes and swimming erratically. Um, and the fish shop owner says, your fish is looking seriously stressed. And then it's got the normal jaws music. And then asks, have you got any cats? Have you got any other pets? Uh, what's around your fish tank, or it was in a fish bowl at that stage. Um, and then she's thinking, 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 and then she thought, ooh, I've got my Libra Fleur tampons on the top shelf, which might fall in. <laughs> yeah. So, fish out of water is not a good sign. So, where are people at? Uh, where are we at in terms of different groups uh, around the world? Um, as I was mentioned earlier, the people for the ethical treatment of animals uh, are using the feelings-based definition. So they're strongly opposed to eating, wearing, experimenting, or using animals, including fish, for entertainment or for any other sort of purposes. They're definitely opposed to recreational and commercial fishing and aquaculture. Um, I guess when we're talking or trying to promote fish welfare to people, um, it's really difficult because they're not that cute, they're not fluffy, they're not furry. They're wet and slimy and they're cold. So the PETA have actually tried to promote uh, people uh, giving fish a new name uh, and they name them sea kittens. <laughs> Uh, RSPC in the UK, they've actually developed a document of welfare standards for farm Atlantic salmon. Um, in those standards, it says that every farm needs a veterinarian uh, and a veterinary health plan. Uh, so they've got policy papers covering uh, most aspects of fish. So that's they're quite well, uh, far in advance to us. And the Animal Welfare Bill in October uh, 2005, um, it 
I guess it covers fish, but only fish in inland waters. It doesn't apply to fish in the oceans. And it doesn't apply to anything in the normal course of fishing. So a fish is an animal in fresh water, but a fish is not an animal in salt water, is what they say. Um, but if you are interested, you can join the World Aquatic Veterinary Medical Association. Um, they've actually got vets out in the UK that go to these professional fishing tournaments um, to actually stitch up the mouth of the fish if they get injured and then release them back into the wild uh, for future fishing. <laughs> so I guess uh, animal welfare is quite high there um, and they do value and look after fish. So even though they're sports fishermen, you might think that they might be rednecks, but they actually do care for the fish and they can kiss them and then release them. Um, if you notice the slide before, um, there was a little sort of car cartoon of a barramundi that says, I'm not an animal. Um, in terms of Australia, uh, the rules are quite different in each state. Um, fish are covered in some states under the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act. But fish are not animals in all states. Uh, in ACT in New South Wales, there are animals, so they are covered by this act. In Queensland, they are animals and they can be afforded animal welfare, except if you're going to use them for live baits. Uh, so it's okay to stick a hook through a fish and use them as live bait, but everything else you're not allowed to, which is quite, uh, quite weird. Uh, in WA in South Australia, fish are not considered uh, animals and humans are not considered animals either, so fish are humans. <laughs> in Northern Territory, uh, they are animals, uh, only if they're kept in captivity for recreational or commercial fishing purposes. Um, and I guess if this goes on, so last point is there is an, a lot of uncertainty over uh, whether fish are animals and what sort of welfare should we afford them, and even like what species they're dealing with and also whether they live in the ocean or they live in the rivers. One of the most confusing things, I guess, if you're a barramundi and you're in England, but you wouldn't be a barramundi in England because the water would be too cold. Um, let's say you're a salmon, okay. If you're a salmon, you live your, uh, your young life as a freshwater fish, you're covered under the uh, Welfare Act, but as soon as you go out to sea, you're no longer considered a fish or an animal, so you can, anything can be done to you. Uh, but then, where does the line lie? Because as you know, uh, there is brackish water, the transitional phase, where the water is slightly salty, not quite sal that salty, not quite fresh. So if you're in, caught in brackish water, are you an animal or are you a fish? Or what do you do there? Not really sure. RSPC in Australia shows that there is clear, uh, their attitude is that there is clear evidence that fish are sentient animals capable of experiencing pain and suffering. Uh, they believe that fish should be uniformly protect, protected under the state and territory animal welfare legislation. So in terms of people fishing, they are opposed to um, leaving the fish to sort of suffocate in the air. Um, and they support the percussive stunning or electrical stunning methods uh, in, as a means of euthanizing fish. Um, one of, I guess, one of the things about um, fish euthanasia, I get asked this question quite a lot, uh, what's the best way to do it? Uh, I guess the gold standard is an anesthetic overdose. Uh, the next best, but not that much lower um, in terms of what is a good thing to do is uh, this thing called percussive stunning, which is pretty much uh, sort of a neat way of saying bashing them on the head really hard and making, knocking them unconscious. Uh, it might seem brutal, but uh, your end point or the effect of it is that you don't want the fish to suffer. And so long as you uh, provide an adequate blow to the right um, anatomic location, uh, fish will not suffer and they will not feel pain. Uh, so it might look gross um, and sort of barbaric, but I think that's still a really um, 
sort of acceptable way of euthanizing fish. Um, how about animal welfare for crustaceans and mollusks? Um, they're excluded at the moment because it's just really too hard. I think we're battling with fish at the moment, so we'll, we can tackle that a bit later on. Uh, with the ADA, they have a position on recreational fishing, saying that it's okay to fish for them, but uh, pain and stress must be minimized. Um, and the aquaculture industries in Australia. Um, good welfare, um, in terms of the function space definition, is uh, correlated to good productivity. So uh, they have good codes of practice um, advocating good welfare, especially humane slaughter of fish um, in terms of the flesh quality and things like that. So we'll get onto that in slide, uh, slide point eight. Uh, commercial fishing sector, they don't really have a code of practice um, addressing welfare issues. Um, most of their codes of practice tend to cover um, reduction of bycatch um, and improvement of fish uh, meat quality. And how about the ornamental fish industry? Um, I guess the biggest body is the Pet Industry Association of Australia. Uh, they do have a voluntary code of practice, uh, but they don't really detail too much about fish welfare. Uh, and their focus is more towards um, sort of purchasing fish that are locally bred to sort of decrease the sort of transport stress and quarantine stress that the fish have to go through uh, before they get to your normal retail shop. Um, and I guess one of the flaws in the code of practice is that it only applies to retailers. Um, it does not apply to the wholesalers, breeders or the importers. Um, in terms of universities, uh, universities are sort of governed under the federal uh, law, so fish are covered under the Animal Ethics Committee, um, and every prac that you do, every fish that you use, and any fish that dies uh, will need to be reported under the Animal Ethics Committee. So the pracs that we're going to be doing on the next Wednesdays, um, they've all been approved uh, by the Animal Ethics Committee, uh, but if you have any sort of qualms about it, um, definitely just come up and see us um, and we can try and see if we can do something, uh, an alternative thing, um, if you wish. So, it comes to this, what do you do when you learn more? Um, so I'm not sure if any one of you have changed your opinions on things. Uh, but maybe it broadens your mind that you've actually heard this um, but sometimes maybe the more you hear it uh, the more this will sit in your mind and the more you think about it you might change your mind or you might not so what measures are in place at the moment um, <clears throat> in terms of aquaculture um, we've got two main anesthetics that are used uh, that is benzocaine or aqs um, AQS has been registered for use in several species, so it includes salmonids, um, abalone, and also uh, rock lobsters. Um, but just because it's registered uh, for one species, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to work in another. Uh, the abalone farms, for example, if you're dealing with black lip, brown lip, or raw abalone, <coughs> AQS would work really well. However, if you're using green lip abalone, uh, if you're trying to anesthetize green lip abalone, uh, benzocaine would be the better sort of um, anesthetic. Um, and lobsters during harvesting or um, uh, at harvesting time, they would actually decrease the water temperature, add aqueous, and sedate them a little bit as well. Uh, that way, they won't get too stressed when you're handling them. <coughs> How about slaughter? Um, I think some aquaculture farms, they use uh, calm dioxide anesthetic bath to euthanize the fish. Uh, some use AQS, which can be quite expensive, but there's no withholding period, so uh, it's able to be used for food fish. Um, and this picture here I actually took um, at Cayley's in Leaderville. Uh, you can see they've got little circles on the head of the fish, and I think that is probably where the fish were stunned 
um, was probably a little bolt. So that's a fairly humane way, a pretty good humane way of uh, sort of harvesting the fish. And again, with harvesting abalone, they're put into an anesthetic bath. Um, that way they're easy, uh, they sort of go to sleep and they're also easy to shut. So, um, yeah, that brings me to the end uh, of my talk. But um, if you're interested more about fish health um, and diseases and welfare and things like that, um, you can follow me on all the different social media platforms. <coughs> and also, I've just published a book called Fish Vetting Essentials. It's essential for every vet in every clinic. So, yeah, thank you very much for listening.